Pastor Eric Watkins. Dr. Watkins, how are you, brother? Doing very well. Good it's, to be here. It's good to have you um, on the AGR podcast, video cast. I've wanted to have you on for some time, um, and you're right down the street, so I feel somewhat neglectful, and I'm so grateful that you have taken time out of your busy day to come on and uh, and talk to the listeners here and tell us a little about yourself and your ministry and also your incredible story, which we're going to get to here shortly. Thanks. Good yeah. to be here. So yeah, maybe just uh, tell us a little bit, Eric, about um, who you are. I mean, you're obviously a pastor in the OPC, but you're... you're um, your background, your training, and uh, yeah, a little bit to get to know you. Yeah, I'm currently serving Harvest Orthodox Presbyterian Church in San Marcos, California, as an OPC minister, and I appreciate your condescension to have an OPC guy <laughs> on your show. It's nice For a you. URC guy and an OPC I know, guy. I it's a stretch, but <laughs> we can work it out. And then I also direct the Center for Missions and Evangelism mm -hmm. from Mid-America Reformed yeah. Seminary in You've uh, done good work over there. Indiana. Yeah. It's been fun. It's yeah. been fun to... Yeah, kind of uh, move the ball down the court mm -hmm. a little bit. They've given me a lot of breathing room. It's been enjoyable. And I've been involved in church planting for the OPC uh, for the majority of the 23 years. I've been pastoring full-time from planting two churches in Florida uh, to serving on Presbyterian mm -hmm. denominational committees and just getting to know some really great guys from whom I've learned a lot and just enjoyed fant fantastic fellowship over just uh, you know wanting to see the kingdom expand through evangelism. Mm. 23 years as I'm a pastor old. now. Well, I'm, I'm, I got 20, so, but I've got more gray hair than you. Your, your gray hair shows in the beard a little, but um, not on top, which is kind of remarkable. I married well and I surf a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so 23 years pastoral ministry, planning two churches. That's, um, that's wonderful. And sometimes guys who are in more established churches, you know, feel that they're, they're either more planters or more, uh, established church, you know, pastors, you feel, you feel you could do work in both arenas. That's an interesting question because one of my former ruling elders liked this metaphor, which probably breaks down at a point, but he liked to distinguish hunter gatherers from farmers. <laughs> and if that's an apt way to describe the difference, I'm yeah. probably much more of a hunter gatherer okay. than a farmer. Uh, and I think the Lord raises up and he uses yeah. both, you know, even in the new Testament, uh, you see men, who just seem to be sort of mobile yeah. and planting as they go and not necessarily even staying in one place terribly, right. terribly long. And then you see other men who are like trees that just dig roots and, and yeah. are unmovable. Yeah. And I, I appreciate the fact that, uh, that the church seems to need both. It's wonderful. Yeah. I, I think I'd like to be a hunter gatherer. I try to be as a farmer <laughs> yeah. um, locally here. Uh, I, I have this, you know, this drive to want to get to the community and um, sometimes you do feel like, well, I think it was Jay Vernon McGee who said burping the babies. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting, though. I mean, Paul tells Timothy, I think it's 2 Timothy 4, 5. I might be wrong on the reference, but I think that's right. Where he tells Timothy, who's the third pastor at Ephesus, Paul was the first, then John, who's exiled at Patmos, and then Timothy comes to Ephesus. And in the context of Timothy's ministry to the Ephesian church, Paul tells Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. That's right. And so I, I, yeah. I don't allow, at least in my mind and exegesis, the idea that, that pastors sort of have an out right. from doing evangelism, that 100%. but rather that some pastors may be more gifted right. at evangelism, just as others may be more gifted mm -hmm. at shepherding. Um, so that, that verse for me means a lot because there's a distinct gift of evangelist in Ephesians 4, but Timothy is the most bread and butter, ordinary means of grace mm -hmm. pastor. Right arguably in the New Testament, covenant kid, you know, in the whole right. nine yards. And yet even he is commanded in the context of one of the healthiest churches in the mm -hmm. New Testament to continue to do the work of an evangelist and thereby fulfill his ministry. Right. Amen. Um, backing up a little bit. So you have, uh, you're married and you have how many children? Yeah, I'm married to Heather. Been mm -hmm. married for almost 28 years now. A uh, wonderful, godly lady with fantastic taste in everything except husbands. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I thank the Lord that's, for her blindness. It's true for almost every pastor's <laughs> wife, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And then we have four adopted kids, okay. 17, 16, 7, and 5. Wonderful. Uh, we are a fantastic mess, and, <laughs> and my octogenarian mother lives with us as well. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, we are like a Saturday Night Live skit gone you horribly are busy. wrong. You are yeah. busy. Yeah. Uh, I understand a busy family. <laughs> there's, a, there's always something going on, and I feel like, well, you're, you're just a few years older than me. Um, not much, though. So 52. Yeah. So we're, we're, you know, we're at that crucial point where they're sort of at the end of the home life and, yeah. you know, ready to move my, my daughter's at college. And, um, I, I, I hate to say I'm looking forward to a different stage in life. Cause I think I'll really miss this one, but sometimes I am. <laughs> my wife and I question whether or not we're going to live long enough to be empty <laughs> nesters. We're, we're a decade behind all of our peers because yeah. of a infertility narrative that we went through and we're humbled by. And, Thank God for, yeah. because it led us to the four kids that we yeah. now have, and Wonderful. we wouldn't change anything. But when you do the math, it's not on my side. When my youngest retires, excuse me, when she graduates high school, I should be retiring the same year. I will be 65 when Liara graduates high school. <clears throat> so um, yeah. that's sobering for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on today, I, I read um, the sort of late last year piece in Christianity Today. Um, I, I should have I should have wrote, written down the title. I know it had Deadhead in it. Um, uh, would God's you, Grace you, on a Greyhound Bus. Yeah, yeah, a Greyhound Bus of all too. Um, yeah. But um, that was that was a really fascinating piece, and it was passed around largely, shared widely. And I thought um, it might encourage those who watch to hear your story. A everyone has a story. Everyone has a story of deliverance. Um, you know, I, I was just teaching my uh, 12th graders catechism today, and we were talking about this point. We were talking about conversion in the Ordo Salutis. And we were talking about, you know, uh, I, I posed the question to some, do you ever remember a time when you, you know, didn't believe the gospel and you you were converted? And they all, some of them paused. Some said yes. Some said, I never can, can uh, I, I've always been able to remember a time where I believed the gospel. But I challenged them. I said, do you remember when you made profession? And you turned from your sin and you were conscious of that and aware of that. And, and they all said, yes, I was really, it's, it's a wonderful thing. We have to, we have to know our, our second part of the Heidelberg, which is a wonderful um, document. OPC should use it more, but uh, <laughs> I think I've heard of it. <laughs> you know, what, what three things must you know? And um, first is the greatness of your sin and misery. Yeah. Right. And I thought your, um, your story is fascinating. So tell, tell us a little bit about, uh, your your background and and um, maybe for the for those who haven't haven't read the article, um, the Eric Watkins' story. Great sinners need a great savior, mm -hmm. and that's my story. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm a great sinner, and by God's grace, I've met a great savior in mm -hmm. Jesus. And my wife and I are kind of the opposite story. She's third generation pastor's kid who, like me and kids in your church, yeah. grew up <clears throat> almost in a certain sense not really remembering not being a Christian, right. And I think I'd preface my story in telling it with, um, in many ways, I feel like a covenant kid grown up and spared from so many of the things that I went through has the better story. And as a dad of four mm -hmm. kids, I don't want my kids to have my story. I'd much right. rather them have Heather's. This is an important point. It really is an important point yeah. <clears throat> because sometimes we get impressed with the sort of flash in the pan mm -hmm. of people that are saved dramatically and it can unintentionally diminish our appreciation for the covenant kid raised up under the ordinary means of grace, mm -hmm. which I think is the norm. Right. It's it something we norm. should be right. really excited about and see it as fantastically, you know, it really is miraculous. It's the new birth. Mm -hmm. But in God's providence, I grew up outside the church. My dad was a career Marine. So we grew up mostly around uh, North Carolina military bases. Mm -hmm. e even my coming into the world is something of a kindness and hardness um, at the same time. We lived on the very famous military base, Camp Lejeune, mm -hmm. North Carolina. And between myself and my older sister are nine years. And my mom had seven miscarriages in those nine years, drinking that water on that base. I have an older sister who's bed bound with horrible really? medical I've conditions. Seen, I've seen, as a I've seen of it. all the commercials about it's that. It's a real deal. I mean, it's our a family, real deal. Yeah. I was with my sister last night in Corona, who is bed bound and horrific oh, pain. And so she was a little kid yeah. drinking the water on that base while my mom was drinking it and losing children in utero. 
And then my get, my dad got transferred by the Marine Corps to St. Louis, Missouri, <clears throat> late Vietnam era to recruit in Ferguson, Missouri in the hood. My, my dad is light skinned, black guy, black enough to be recruiting in Ferguson, Missouri to get young guys to go to the Marine Corps. And that's where I was born in 1972, providentially because my mom got taken off that base. And so she was able to sustain me in the womb. And then when we went back to that area, we were living off base. My little brother came next. So life, in a certain sense for me, was a miracle. But then growing up, you know, we were a non-Christian family. Uh, my dad was an atheist. My mom had no meaningful professional faith at all. And then my dad left our family abruptly when I was 12 years old, which just in, introduced a a beginning of a real hard dark season. I was 12. My brother was 10. You know, we started experimenting with drugs and alcohol and all the other bad stuff at that age. Mom's working like 70 hours a week. We're latchkey kids with a house to ourselves and room for a lot of stupid in our life. And, you know, that's what I did. I don't, you know, applaud it or celebrate it, but this reality of it is that's what we were doing. So by the time I graduated high school, I'd been shot at twice. I had been arrested once. I failed my senior year of high school and had to repeat it and was voted by my high school senior class the most likely to live in a Volkswagen van, Mm -hmm. which I'm still not quite sure what that meant. (laughs) Um, Had dreadlocks down past my shoulders for a while, which I thought were kind of cool. And it's part of my retirement plan, actually. (laughs) I I love every once in a while I see like an older black man with dreadlocks. He he looks like a lion to me. And I I like that look, but we'll we'll get to that. (laughs) Check me out in like five years. We'll see what's happening. I doubt we would uh, find that in a reformed (laughs) pulpit, right? So there are lots of guys that look like that in the OPC. We just need a few more. So um, in God's providence, you know, high school years were really uh, dark and unsatisfying. Yeah. You know, there are things I enjoyed doing, even apart from things sinful, like surfing, playing guitar. And I got into music a lot. Uh, I got into the mosh pit a lot. Um, but bands like the Grateful Dead and Bob Most Marley. Most people don't know what a mosh pit is anymore, do they? Yeah, that's probably I, good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a mosh pit is a bunch of... Um, Young people bouncing around mm. in a small contained area to loud music. It's a Gen X thing. It's a Gen X thing. Yeah, yeah. I broke my arm twice, my nose once in <laughs> mosh pits, and I'm sure I we, hospitalized other people. We were tougher for it, but not better. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I'm sure I lost a few brain cells to that as well. So towards the end of high school, um, my brother and I are really into the Grateful Dead and can cover a lot of their music on guitar, and we'd gone to a lot of concerts, and I graduated high school Moved down to the beach, was surfing, delivering pizzas, selling pot. That's just what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And tried a little community college degree and just wasn't ready for it. So I dropped out and my brother and I decided to follow the Grateful Dead around the country and sell sheets of acid and live in campgrounds or wherever and grow dreadlocks. And so we did that for about a year. And, you know, it might sound kind of cool, but after a while, like living with hippies gets really old and it doesn't smell great. (laughs) I mean, the smell of patchouli can only cover so many sins. And there's a certain Groundhog Day sort of effect with life following the Grateful Dead where every day becomes a repeat of the previous, Mm -hmm. right? You wake up, um, you travel around, you scrounge up food and pot and, you know, you hope for a concert and you travel with hippies to the concert. Mm -hmm. And then if you get in the concert... You know, that night's a party, but then the next day it's kind of like, okay, we're going to do this again and then again and again and again. And so after doing that for a while, we'd ended up in Northern California. And after a concert, I just felt kind of, kind of done, yeah. a little bored. I Especially say like, from Northern California. Yeah. It, I was, mean, it was January. It yeah. was cold. It was rainy. I remember. Yeah. And just thinking like, there's got to be more to life than this. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't suicidal and I certainly wasn't converted to Christianity. I was just getting bored. And so I decided, all right, I'm going to go back to North Carolina and maybe get back into that degree program. I've I've got to do something with my life other than sell sheets of acid and grow hair. Mm -hmm. So I bought a ticket for a Greyhound bus ride cross country. And my older sister I was talking about earlier, um, she lived in California at the time and was flirting with Christianity at Mm -hmm. that time. And at a bus station, hugged me, said, hey, why don't you take my Bible? You'll have nothing else to do for a week. You know, maybe you can read this if you want. And I, I politely said no. And she's like, come on, you don't have anything else to do. I'm like, all right. So I took the Bible, got on the bus. And after a couple of days, I'm playing guitar. And then eventually my fingers kind of wore out. So I'm trapped on the back of a bus and decided, okay, look, I grew up in North Carolina and 
I never liked Christianity, but I think a better way to put it is I never liked the church. Mm-hmm. Like my perception growing up as a biracial guy in North Carolina was that the majority of racial vocabulary that I learned, I heard from people I perceived as churchgoers. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my party friends were churchgoers. And, you know, if you wanted to hear the N word over and over, just go to the country club. Like that's just sort of, and those are all churchgoers. So I had this perception of cultural Christianity that was not very positive, but I'd never read the Bible and and probably not thought a lot about Jesus apart from people that seemed to represent him to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm trapped on this bus and decide, you know, why not? I looked at the table of contents and I have a little brother named Mark. And I immediately got jealous. Like, my brother has a book of the Bible named after him. That's pretty cool. There's looking around. There's no book of Eric, not even in the Old Testament. Um, So I decided I would read the Gospel of Mark. And I honestly think, Chris, like, I think that's where the Lord may have converted me. Like, I had a a genuine sense, an almost palpable sense of conviction. Wow. Like, I I felt arrested. Some people— Had you ever heard preaching? I think probably on summer vacation— my grandmother, who went to church in Indiana, had probably taken us to church a handful of times. But that was it. That was it. Okay. Didn't go to church with my friends. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I think, I'm not sure I could tell you what, like, denominational setting yeah. or you know, yeah. anything categorical about that. <clears throat> but I remember reading the Bible and just really feeling like no contest on the idea that I was a sinner. And, 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 and even just like a sense of fear, like, you know, that inescapable reality that I've been made by one to whom I must answer. Mm -hmm. I think I had that, you know, which is obviously the work of the spirit Mm -hmm. to say things better now than you could back then. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I remember feeling meaningfully arrested, which I had been before, but I also had like a real sense that like the the gospel made sense to me. Mm -hmm. Not only the idea that Christ had died for sinners like me, like that, really made sense to me, but a a standout feature, and you can sense the frail little boy here speaking, but even the idea of God as a father, I just remember thinking like that, that's, that's kind of meaningful Mm -hmm. as one that grew up without a dad. And, you know, for a lot of latchkey kids without dads, that's a bigger emotional imprint than people I think are often willing to recognize and engage And at the end of the day, for me, it was a, it was just a, a very meaningful moment. The way I like to say it is I got on this bus, a long-haired, stinking deadhead, and I got off the bus a week later. It's a long wow. trip cross-country from San Francisco to North Carolina. But I got off the bus a week later, a longer-haired, stinkier Christian. But I think there was real conversion and even evidence of it. So as I'm coming cross-country, I had not seen or talked to my dad in years. But I I felt so set free, Chris, by the gospel. Mm-hmm. Like I, I was a studied yeah. sinner. Yeah with a heavy burden on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really I was just, you know, running from who I was, Mm -hmm. pursuing the Grateful Dead and drugs. They're all forms of escapism. Mm -hmm. I was running from who I was. And now I had something to run to. And having not seen or talked to my dad in quite a while, good number of years, I decided to make a beeline for him. So I pulled over, you know, got off at a bus station, called him from a payphone. They had those back in the early 1990s, a payphone. You can look yeah. it up on Wikipedia. What, what's that? Exactly. <laughs> um, 25 <clears throat> cents. Are you yeah, serious? Yeah. <laughs> Quarters. They even had a money made of metal, believe it or not. And so I called my dad and said, I, you know, I, I'd like to see, I've got mm-hmm. some things I'd like to talk about. And I, I got up there to where he was at just outside of Greensboro, North Carolina. And it turns out in God's providence, he had become a Christian the same year. Amazing. And my dad was a chiseled Marine. Like if you've seen the movie Rambo, like that was my dad, like, you know, just a, a very healthy specimen of a man, killing machine, a man of few words, a much better soldier than a father who had been converted and was praying for some way to repair things with the family. Wow. And so Here not show up. not terribly long after this, not only do he and I reconcile there in person, which was just one of the more beautiful memories of my life, but he <clears throat> actually came down to a family reunion in Jacksonville, North Carolina, in front of my family and, and got down on his knees and through tears, mm-hmm. begged my family for forgiveness for the harm you'd wow. done. Wow. That's and then he, then he sang a song called Watch the Lamb, which is not a not a bad sort of evangelical contemporary song. And, and the point that he was making there was to take our eyes off of him and look mm-hmm. to Christ. Yeah. So he died right after we moved here to California. 
He died uh, early 2021, but he finished well and we finished well Amazing. together. Amazing. Um, and it just, I think, is a significant testimony uh, to God's grace, not just like in my life personally, but like even in my family. My mom would end up becoming a Christian yeah. and is a member in the OPC. My sister, who's dying with these medical conditions from the water crisis, is a member in the OPC that, you know, the Lord has done just a great work in converting a lot of Watkins who who would have seemed to many 20 years ago the most unlikely suspects for the kingdom of God. You know, there's lots to lots to talk about here. <laughs> um, amazing story, amazing work of God's grace in your life, brother. Um, it, it, it makes me think of Jacob, who was such a rebel, and then the Lord converts him, and then all of a sudden he's reconciling with Esau. <laughs> you know, it's like it's just amazing how the Lord works situations like that to bring reconciliation and the beauty of that right after. But going back to your conversion, there's something that I. I I, I want to want to talk about um, Christopher Yuan has been on here. It was the same story. Um, his his parents gave him a Bible mm. and threw it in the trash at first. You know, um, I was a church boy, and I had heard sermons most of my life. I was sleeping through most of them, um, but it was at Humboldt State, Northern California, hippie land. By the way, um, nice. Yeah. Uh, and that place was something else. Um, we could, we don't have to go there, but I, I, I remember being in my apartment at the time and opening up Romans three and I was converted reading Romans three. Mm. Like it wasn't and all those years of preaching laid some kind of foundation. Obviously I was born up in a Christian home, but it wasn't until 21 years old that I was actually reading the scriptures and believe I walked up, walked out of a room converted. So I, I guess I'm uh, what I'm trying to capitalize on here is you know we're we're big believers in the means of grace. We're big believers that the primary way God works to save people is through the foolishness of the message preached. But there's also something special in uh, giving people God's word and handing that word to them, and that's your story. I, I guess I find that um, a wonderful encouragement to us to continue to give the scriptures to people. Yeah. Yeah, and I I am a big ordinary means of grace guy mm -hmm. as well. <clears throat> One of my favorite lectures to give, if I can use such a word, is on the reform confessions and evangelism because I I think that they have a not bipolar identity when it comes to the work of conversion, but they have a twofold approach. And the ordinary means of grace, when we use that language, I think we're talking about primarily a ministry to the baptized, mm -hmm. which is proper. Right. But then if you look at, you know, things from like, you know, Canada of Dort 2.5, you know, the promiscuous mm -hmm. preaching of the gospel, I don't right. think that's referring to something that happens on a Lord's Day, right. Sunday morning. Absolutely. Right. And the language, even of the Heidelberg, about wishing to see the gospel brought to all without mm -hmm. distinction. Right. There being no reason why God would privilege one people group over another exactly. in terms of uh, the reception of the gospel. I mean, those things to me are, are really important that we find a place as a church to uh, to bring the gospel to those who are not going to be regularly under the ordinary means of grace, mm -hmm. that they might be brought under the ministry of, of the regular ordinary means of grace. And and that's a big part of my passion is to wanting to see uh, the church healthfully engage both. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's, an, it's an encouragement, though, I think, and to have this kind of mindset um, I mean, your story is so countercultural too. What, what we would think in the church would work, you know, um, handing a scripture to somebody in this kind of hardened sin life, somebody who's anti-institutional, <laughs> right? You know, very, um, very. I, I, we were joking beforehand <laughs> that, you know, the Grateful Dead had ties. And I remember I worked at a men's clothing store and I bought my first Grateful Dead tie and I'd wear that tie and it was a really beautiful tie, but that doesn't make any sense, does it? It's a total paradox. <laughs> total paradox. <laughs> So, um, but I, I think the encouragement here is, is what is countercultural, what we think doesn't work. This is evidence of God's power yeah. in somebody's life to change the human heart. I, I think we have to have confidence that he can do that. Yeah. And I'm forgetting the name of the Puritan pastor who said, <clears throat> all of God's people are called to promote the gospel. Mm -hmm. Not all of God's people are, people are called to proclaim the gospel in exactly the same way. 
So the whole body of Christ has some role to play in the drama of the Great Commission, mm -hmm. if I can turn a phrase, promoting the work of the gospel, i.e. giving the Bible to a friend, to a neighbor, to a relative, mm -hmm. even sharing you know, the, the clear truth claims of the gospel mm -hmm. itself. And then those that are called to gospel ministry, you know, they they exist in one fashion or another with what Paul calls First Corinthians two two that woe is me if I don't preach the gospel, right? And that desire to see the gospel proclaimed to the lost is equally a burden that you know, those that are called to gospel ministry have to bear. Um, and so I, you know, there's there's a lot of work to be done here. But if anything, I would love to encourage those who are listening that there's nobody that God can't save. Mm -hmm. And I think even. Yeah. You know, for me now, many years into uh, my walk with the Lord and serving the church, I, you know, I, I sometimes struggle to believe the things that I teach and preach, at mm -hmm. least in this sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's easy for me to drive past people I can look into the eyes of and, and look at them as hopeless. Right. That's, this, is, this is really important. Yeah. And yet they're not, right? Like mm -hmm. there's nobody who bears the image of God who's beyond the grace of God and the work of the Spirit of God. And that's what crazy stories like mine and yours mm -hmm. really prove is that God can save anyone, but sometimes our faith can be weak in mm -hmm. this area. My faith can be weak in this area, and we pass by people that, you know, they're, they're homeless, they're, you know, they're, they're schizophrenic, they, mm -hmm. they vote the wrong way. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, surely, yeah. surely they are without, you know, yeah. they're outside the reach of the, of the gospel. And I, I just, you know, I find yeah. myself challenged to think more and more that nobody— is outside the reach of God's grace, and that um, if we really believe that, then it should lead to some sort of an active pursuit of those people. See, that's that's exactly right. Um, we and you have to look at where God places you and the people He's put around you. We're always talking about witness and evangelism, and sometimes we miss the opportunities that are so clear right in front of us. You know, I have I have two neighbors on my street. And, and we have, we have quite a few neighbors on our street. I, I think we may be the only family driving out on Sunday mm. for worship in our neighborhood. And you think, you look around, you think, you know, they're all, <laughs> there's no way that person's going to change. You know, that, that thought comes into my head. There's sure. just no way. Sure. And so we think, you know, I'm not, uh, what can I do? One is, um, one is a, um, um, a Sikh. You know, uh, one is a, a Hindu and he's pluralistic in his view on, of, you know, life and, and religion. And I go to the door the other day, he just had a heart issue. And um, even being able to talk to him and share the gospel and recognize it is the power of God to save him, we have to have that kind of confidence in this message. Yeah. And I, I think there are two points of application to, <clears throat> to, to work with what you were saying one is I think we should have that sort of hope regarding our neighbors, you know, pray for them, mm -hmm. pray for them during family devotions, pray for yeah. them. You know, there are settings, right? Even right. as churches where you get to informally get together yeah. and pray. We do it on Wednesday night at our church. There are yeah. men's gatherings, but to, you know, pray that God would convert the lost. The other thing I think is important too is to recognize like in the sense of Colossians 4, walking in wisdom toward right. those who are outside. Right. I, I think people in the pew— should be encouraged to recognize like their their life is constantly lived on a watched stage right. um right. you know the eyes of the world are upon them and neighbors pick up on it you know little gospel moments that uh, really um speak well of the gospel or speak poorly of the gospel mm -hmm. so one of the things that was interesting to me when I when I became a Christian was a few of my friends who were churchgoers or whatever um some of them got really angry at me and then I can remember a couple coming to me in tears, like, you know, all those years we were friends, not only did I never share the gospel with you, I was a perfect hypocrite in front of you. Mm -hmm. And now you are a Christian and I feel bad about my testimony before you. So I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty, yeah. but, I, but I wish our young people had a real sense like that their lives mean something yeah. um, before those that they're around. And, you know, if we call people our friends, what we would want for them most is for them to know Christ. Right. I mean, this is this is what Jesus is talking about at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, salt and light in the world and how we function before those, uh, before unbelievers, before those who are in the darkness. Um, not only do we preserve the world, but we give light to them. Yeah. And they are watching us. I say that, I said that just the other day in a sermon to the congregation, you are being watched. And that's, a, it's an important part of witness. Um, 
you know, I think it was Lloyd Jones who said, and I know it kind of gets abused, but you know, pe- most people who will never read the Bible will read us. So, but we want to have them read the Bible. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a great line, though. It's very convicting. Yeah, it's a very convicting line. So, okay, so you, the beautiful reconciliation with your father who uh, became a believer. What what a remarkable providence. Um, that's why I mentioned the reconciliation. It's it just it, what I've seen. It, after a conversion of, and these kind of stories, it's amazing what the Lord begins to repair. Mm-hmm. And that that's a wonderful encouragement. Um, so then you thought about ministry. How did it go from there? God has a sense of humor. <laughs> <clears throat> He's only full of grace. He must smile and laugh. So after this story with the Grateful Dead and reading the Bible, get converted, I, I go back to North Carolina. I finish this little degree in recreation and meander my way through a few different churches. I got baptized multiple times in a Baptist church because I was a sucker for altar calls. You and, went forward. Oh, more than once. You're friends with Mark Stromberg, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Mark, Mark was on here not so long ago and said he must have walked. He must have walked a hundred times. Oh, I I've said, no way, a hundred yeah. times. <laughs> I'm not sure how much water it takes. But I've been baptized in the church. I've been baptized in the ocean. Yeah. But to be clear, I do know that I only needed one baptism, but <laughs> I was baptized many times because I was a sucker for those. Sure you know, uh, altar call, pressure mm-hmm. point sermons and, um, you know, a young, weak Christian and trying to figure out <clears throat> what was going on. I was charismatic for about 30 minutes, but it, it was really just because there was a beautiful redhead at the charismatic <laughs> church and that wasn't meant to be. And then I found this little Bible church in Moorhead City, North Carolina with some really beautiful people that I'm good friends with to this day. Mm-hmm. And one particular family, I, I don't know what they were thinking, but they actually invited me to live with them. Wow. And the father discipled me. Um, He's one of my closest friends to this day still. And I can just remember just being absolutely dumbfounded by a dad. Mm -hmm. Not just a guy, like a dad, like that clearly loved his wife, loved his kids, got up in the morning, did his devotions, read the Bible with his family, had people from the church. Like it was the real thing. And it heavily, heavily impressed me. And in that context, I was just devouring everything I could. I, you know, nobody had to tell me to read the Bible. I wanted to. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be at Bible studies. I wanted to be where men were discussing the Bible and eating food together. I went to this church's morning and evening service and just wanted to know how I could help. And so I just became like a dry sponge near water that couldn't get enough. And as I got to the end of that two-year degree, I say it playfully, the church kicked me out and made me go to Bible college. Hold on. I want to, I want to pause there. Sure. I, I think this is really important. Um, the paths again, um, the parallels are, are remarkable to the stories that I've had on here and also mine that, you know, we, we, we hear the word of God, we respond to the word of God. He begins a repair process, but he incorporates you into the body. Yeah, he incorporates you in, and that was my experience at Humboldt State, hippie land, by the way. Um, that there was a Bible church up there, and the pastor was going through Romans, and the whole church became an OPC. They were they were just a non denom Bible church. They became an OPC. I was converted in the OPC, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. We keep coming but, back to the OPC. Yeah, Chris. what's the what? deal? I don't know. <laughs> you may have to. Is there an altar call playing in the background? <laughs> for you <laughs> at the OPC. Um, <laughs> but I want to say this, that it was that same incorporation into the church that when you say I became like a dry sponge, right? And and you just soaked it all in, right? Does dry sponge work? Yeah. Anyways, um, so that's exactly what happened to me is that the same thing, I, a family took me in away from home and it was like my first introduction to the fellowship of the saints, yeah. the koinonia, and what how that influenced my whole trajectory going forward. I'm loving hearing, I love hearing you say that because I think people, we get caught up in the dramatic conversion story, but we never get caught up in this part of it. <laughs> the relationship to the church that follows. And I love, I think that's important for people to think about. You know, especially young students, right? College students who have this kind of thing happen. That connection to the church is so vital for their future. I wonder if there's another thread to be pulled here too, which is the fact that you and I have ended up in denominations that are pretty similar and Mm -hmm. have a big emphasis on family and ordinary means of grace in contrast to big emphases on programs. Right. So a big part of my Christian growth as a young man was not a program. It was 
a family. It was community. Mm -hmm. It was people. I'm, I'm not really an anti-program guy per se, as much just to say, I think ordinary means of grace, even <clears throat> smaller group settings like Bible studies, one-on-ones, uh, seeing family worship modeled, built in me, even before I recognized these categories, a high sense of confidence of wanting to do like life on life ministry. Right. Like I, I feel like, you know, if I haven't said it yet, like my, my biggest goal in life right now is, is just to be a good husband right. and a good dad mm -hmm. and to finish well there. Like everything else is like great icing on top of it, mm -hmm. but to just be that like is my goal. Right. Right. And then when I think of like what I'm trying to accomplish in church as a pastor, it's not to build a big program right. or even right. to think in terms of numerics per se, mm -hmm. but just in terms of like faithfulness and small things. And I think those you know, those life on life discipleship opportunities are a really big deal, which is why I think I haven't ended up in like a mega church or a different model that is right. much more defined by programs. Yeah, right. So, you know, that family's involvement in my life and others and yours. And I mean, that that's very biblical, by the way. It is indeed. What about, what about the ministry of preaching? How, so this church you went to, did you find yourself in your mind open to receive the preaching in a way like, I mean, obviously you didn't have a lot of preaching before, but that this, you said, you say dry sponge, this was a moment where the scriptures were being opened to you through the ministry of the word. Yeah. And I remember thinking that the pastor was like a hundred feet tall. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, really, you know, it was. But you're pretty tall. I'm six three. But I mean, just in terms of like respect for the man, yeah. what he was doing. Right. And even when I went to Bible college and when I came to seminary, I went to Westminster, California for my MDiv, but I originally did not come to do the MDiv. I, I came to do the MA and was not even thinking about being a pastor. Mm -hmm. I got tricked along the way, but I went to Bible college and seminary just because I wanted to learn the Bible better mm -hmm. and to grow in this new faith of mine. And I like surfing and you know, it's near the ocean. I don't wanna, <laughs> it's you know, not I don't a bad place to yeah, be. <laughs> I'm not, you know, ignoring those uh, contexts. But the other day, I came to seminary just wanting to study the Bible and learn my own faith better and to be able to defend mm -hmm. my faith better. Yeah. And then while I was here, if I can transition yeah. how I got into the yeah. ministry. So yeah. while I was here, um, I, I kind of bounced around a couple of churches. We were not really reformed when we got to seminary, Heather and me. Uh, we, we bounced off the walls and halfway through we're like, okay, I think this... Calvinism and reform stuff is making sense. And so we started attending an OPC. Uh, the one I'm pastoring now is actually the first OPC we attended. And that church tricked me. I'm saying it with a smile. But they asked me if I would do a Bible study in the summer, uh, which I did. Um, ironically, the house that we live in now backs up to the park <laughs> that we did that first yeah. Bible study in. Yeah. And then they let me do a little bit in Sunday school. And then the pastor began investing time in me. Mm. And, and I think somewhere along the lines they persuaded me to switch to the MDiv and consider being a pastor. But I would say that was terrifying to me. The studying the Bible, teaching the Bible, preaching opportunities, evangelism, all that came pretty reasonably easy or, or well for me. Like I enjoyed doing those things. I was going to do them whether, whether or not I did them vocationally. Mm -hmm. um, nobody had to tell me to be an evangelist. Uh, I, I love this new faith and wanted to talk about Jesus and would get into it with surfers and guys on the racquetball court, just mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but the idea of being a pastor and trying to like navigate like families, I mean, just sounded like infinitely comical. Like how the, I'd never seen a dad. I was going to tell anybody else how to be one yeah. and, you know, marriage counseling. And so that, that side of it for me was, and I think in some, some ways still is the very hardest part mm -hmm. of pastoral ministry but I was persuaded of the doctrine of the church. Mm -hmm. I was persuaded of the ordinary means of grace. And I was persuaded of the work of the spirit. And, and, and then just the internal and external calling, you know, grew mm -hmm. to really want to serve the church and some external affirmation of my modest gifts. Yeah. But the fact that, you know, the crazy hippie voted most likely to live in a Volkswagen van mm -hmm. forever, shot at twice in jail, becomes a pastor in a reformed church. I mean, God is very gracious and he has just not only a wonderful sense mm -hmm. of humor, um, he can take broken stories and make them beautiful. Yeah. I always say, I mean, if you look at Paul, if you look at his whole attitude to the ministry, you know, I, I just started Romans again. And that first line, Paul slave, you know, he, the guy was brilliant. The guy, the guy had the best education of the day in Tarsus and, you know, under the feet of G uh, Gamaliel. And he, was overtaken with the fact 
that God would save the chief of sinners. And that's what made him an effective pastor. Mm. You know, well said. Yeah. And um, that's your story. Same thing. So um, I always think those pastors are the most effective who know where they've come from and who know what God has delivered them from where they were and uh, who keep that. I was, it must have been hard for Paul all his ministry. I never know what the thorn is, but it must have been hard his whole ministry to think that the blood of Stephen was on his hands. He clearly was forgiven, but I'm sure that kept him on his knees. <laughs> I'm preaching Acts 6 this yeah. week where Stephen and the mm-hmm. deacons are introduced and then <clears throat> the stoning comes. So it's interesting that you bring that up, thinking yeah. about Paul. Yeah. Uh, you know, you mentioned Gamaliel, um, who's in at the end of Acts 5, um, when the apostles are beaten. Yeah. Um, and so you get the sense now that Paul's looming in the background. And I, and I do think there's something for that, that heart. I like the way you put it, you know, remembering where you're from. Um, that is a big part of, I think, the way that God has worked in me. Like, I love the church. Right. But I, but I see in the lost a reflection of myself. I see in high school kids doing stupid mm-hmm. a reflection of myself. Right. Right. And, you know, not only want the gospel for them, but even looking at, you know, families and otherwise. But, but I also think it speaks to the hunter gatherer side of me as well. That mm-hmm. I'm, I'm probably more comfortable around non Christians than Christians. Mm-hmm. Christians scare me sometimes. Well, I, you know, that's, <laughs> I hate to say this, brother. I get it. I'm, I'm kind of the same way. You know, from my upbringing. So it's like, um, um, it's it's a wonderful thing, especially it gives us a, a a whole outlook of compassion, especially on the young people today. They're just, they're lost. You know, they're walking around without any direction. And um, you have that story. I have that story. It should, it should give us that kind of hunter-gatherer desire for them. Amen. Yeah. Um. I'm I'm thankful for your story. I think I think I want to say uh, in closing, what an encouragement um, that the Lord could take you know you from where you were, Eric, and bring you into the ministry. Um, that's an encouragement for for anyone right now, especially a parent who has a, a wandering son or daughter, um, or mm-hmm. somebody who's departed from the faith. Um, in this life, they're not beyond the mercy and grace of the Lord to restore them, and. Um, here you are, evidence as a reform pastor. Again, you could have been a pastor in many different places, but in an OPC, URC context, it's a remarkable testimony of grace because um, it's everything contrary to what you came out of. So, yeah, Lord is very good. And it makes me just thankful each day. My wife and I read Psalm 121 together this morning. And, you know, we have trials and challenges before us. And yet we remind ourselves all the time that the Lord loves our children more than we do. He loves my wife more than I do. He loves his church. He's a far better Mm -hmm. shepherd and pastor uh, to the people of God. And he has a big heart for the lost in ways I think that we fail to comprehend, even as Reformed Calvinistic folk. And if I could maybe just close with a short story as an illustration. When my wife and I were married, we planned to have six kids. We want to have a big family. She's from a big family. We wanted to have a lot of kids. Um, and so we had this table, I had a table built for her at our seventh anniversary um, by an Amish family in Pennsylvania. And it had eight chairs, two for Heather and me, six for the kids. We had names picked out for those kids. And then in God's providence, we began down an infertility narrative that we did not see coming, end up learning we couldn't have children. That led to us adopting. Mm-hmm. And we never got to six. We only adopted four. And we sometimes will stretch out that table. And there are two empty chairs room for more at the table. Mm-hmm. We're not adopting any more kids. We've, we've tapped out <laughs> <laughs> hands on the mat. Um, but, but I think that's a great way of thinking about the church and God's heart. Like when, you know, when, when people are brought into the kingdom of God, they are given a place at the table of the family mm-hmm. of God. Right. And one of my most treasured doctrines in our confessions is that of adoption. Mm-hmm. And if we Precious. think of, yeah. So if we think of God as an adopting God, the church as an adopted family and empty seats there are empty seats at the table and yet mm-hmm. god has a plan to fill those seats mm-hmm. and to have a small part in that to be part of the means that god would use to gather his children into his family into his arms to his table i just think is one of the most wonderful privileges that we can possibly know wonderful thanks brother for coming on today and telling your, your story uh it's a real blessing to me and i'm sure to our listeners and um Pray that the Lord continues to bless your ministry 
And uh, thanks for being here. My pleasure. 